on this week's edition of In Focus. In the midst of this election year, another consequential week for our nation. As our current president insists he's staying in the race, our former president is declaring victory in court after the Supreme Court ruled that U.S. presidents are legally immune from criminal prosecution for any quote-unquote official acts while in office. But now that ruling has also delayed former President Trump's sentencing on hush money charges in New York. As President Biden speaks out against the court's ruling amid the many questions about his own future. Raquel Martin has more today from our Washington Bureau. The historic ruling all but guarantees former President Donald Trump will not face criminal trial for his role leading up to the January 6th riot before Election Day. Moments after the decision was released, Trump saying that it is, quote, a win for the Constitution and democracy. It was the most highly anticipated and, by some accounts, most consequential ruling of the year. In a 6-3 to three decision, the Supreme Court declared U.S. presidents immune from prosecution for official acts. It's a dangerous precedent. President Biden is slamming the decision. Today's decision almost certainly means that there are virtually no limits on what a president can do. He says the ruling effectively shields former President Trump from January 6th related criminal charges until after the election. The public has a right to know the answer about what happened on January 6th before they asked to vote again this year. MAGA Republicans are celebrating. On Truth Social, Trump called the ruling a big win for democracy. The court's conservative majority suggested without some immunity, prosecution of ex-presidents could quickly become routine. The three liberal justices sharply disagreed. Justice Sonia Sotomayor writing the decision, quote, makes a mockery of the principle foundational to our Constitution, that no man is above the law. The ruling does leave presidents on the hook for non-official acts. But George Washington University professor Paul Schiff Berman warns it would be difficult to separate the two. It's hard to imagine any prosecution of a president that would not involve some intrusion on executive power. The Justice Department, which brought forward the charges against the former president, has not weighed in on the Supreme Court decision. The case will now head back to a lower court for a judge to decide exactly which charges are deemed an official act. For now in Washington, Raquel Martin, back to you. Raquel, thanks. President Biden did not take any questions after those remarks you saw from Monday night. He continues to face questions, though, about last week's debate and whether he's considering stepping aside. So far, his campaign insists he is not. He sat down with George Stephanopoulos for an interview this weekend. But as Jesse Tournour reports, he and the White House continue to face a lot of questions about whether he's staying in the race for good. President Biden is only ramping up his public appearances after last week's debate. Good afternoon. But the various visits are not tamping down concerns about the future of his campaign. We get it. The president uh, did not have a great night. In the first press briefing since the debate, White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre said President Biden is still battling a cold and his reelection campaign is not going anywhere. He knows how to do the job. But Texas Congressman Lloyd Doggett does not think that's enough anymore becoming the first Democrat to publicly call on President Biden to withdraw from the 2024 race. In a statement, Doggett said, President Biden saved our democracy by delivering us from Trump in 2020. He must not deliver us to Trump in 2024. Other Democrats have criticized President Biden since his debate against former President Donald Trump, but have stopped short of calling on him to withdraw. Rhode Island Senator Sheldon Whitehouse said he was horrified by President Biden's frail appearance. People want to make sure that this is a campaign that's ready to go and win, that the president and his team are being candid with us about his condition. But the Senate's top Democrat, Leader Chuck Schumer, said President Biden remains fit to serve. We've worked hard together for four years and delivered a lot for America and for central New York. I'm for Biden. The Democratic National Committee could formally nominate President Biden as its candidate as early as mid-July, ahead of the August convention. In Washington, I'm Jesse Tenor. Jesse, thanks. We'll discuss it with our panel coming up and look at some of the latest poll numbers. In the meantime, this week we learned a member of Congress from our state is now facing weapons charges for bringing a gun to the airport. Congresswoman Victoria Sparks' office says it was all an accident. Her office said she didn't realize it was in her suitcase when she went through security at Dulles Airport last Friday. 
They said she didn't have a magazine or any bullets. The Metropolitan Washington Airport Authority confirmed she was indeed charged with a weapons violation. Now, Sparks is running for re-election this year after initially saying she would not seek another term. She won the Republican primary and she'll face Democratic candidate Deborah Pickett in November. Other important races we're watching this year, Indiana Congressman Jim Banks running for U.S. Senate. He's up against Democrat Valerie McRae and Libertarian Andrew Horning in the November election. And that's the Senate seat currently held by Mike Braun, who's running for governor this year. He'll face Democratic candidate Jennifer McCormick and Libertarian Donald Rainwater in the, in the race to replace current Governor Eric Holcomb. In the meantime, this past week, a number of new laws took effect after getting the governor's approval this past spring. Among them, a new law establishing a green alert for missing at-risk veterans, a law that lowers the number of wetlands in our state that are eligible for environmental protection, and a law that finally allows restaurants and bars to hold happy hour discounts on alcohol. There's also a controversial new reading law that took effect this past week that has some educators concerned. Our State House reporter Hannah Adamson spoke with people on both sides of that issue. It was the top priority bill in the Indiana State Senate this session and caused some controversy among educators. The author of SB1, a former educator herself, tells me the goal was to curb an alarming trend in education Indiana has faced for several years. Reading is so fundamental to every part of education. State Senator Linda Rogers says roughly one in every five third graders is not reading at grade level, something she's confident a new reading proficiency law she wrote, which takes effect next week, will begin to change. The legislation is really about identifying students that are having difficulty reading much earlier than the third grade. The law requires schools to provide summer school and individualized tutoring to elementary school students struggling to read. It also requires many elementary school teachers to take 80 extra hours of free literacy training. A number of teachers are already started down this path, but they do have until July of 2027 or when they renew their license. However, the law also requires third graders without a special exemption be held back if they fail the state's I-read assessment. Indiana State Teachers Association President Keith Gamble says while the law's specialized support requirements could benefit kids struggling to read, the retention requirement misses the mark. What we are concerned about is not taking time to look at what can happen um, in years to come, depending on the number of students that may need to be retained. But how do we push someone on to the fourth grade when they can't read? Reporting in Indianapolis, I'm Hannah Adamson. Hannah, thanks. Coming up next on this week's edition of In Focus, we'll talk with our panel about the Supreme Court's immunity ruling, what it means for former President Trump, and the ongoing fallout from President Biden's debate performance. What it means for 2024 and a look at the latest polling numbers right after this.